So good morning uh, and welcome to this session. It is my, my great privilege to, to chair it. The title is uh, uh, Private Investments in Research, the Rapidly Evolving Landscape Around the World. And of course, we have to see what's happening uh, here, uh, here in Greece. And I'm very happy, very honored to have uh, uh, the panelists with me. Uh, Yanis Kaltsas is the head of division and actually the, the, the head of the investment team of, for Greece and Cyprus of the European Investment Bank. And another Yanis, Yanis Gikopoulos, he is the uh, chief innovation officer and uh, head of AI and analytics in Qualco. Michalis Vafopoulos, founder and CEO of uh, Link Business and with uh, many hats, actually, the Dimitris Angelakis, Professor Dimitris Angelakis. He's a professor at the Technical University of Crete, but also a PI at the uh, Center for Quantum Technologies and Quantum Computing in Singapore, and founder of a, of a startup called Angel Q Quantum Computing. Uh, so here they are uh, to, to, to talk about this, this very, very interesting uh, topic. So the last, uh, the last few years, we are all witnessing a, an unprecedented growth in, in technology, an exponential growth in technology, I, I would say. And this has, has created, has brought a lot of, of, of disruption in, in, in the world, worldwide in, in the research ecosystem. Uh, a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, we were all uh, witnessing the major scientific achievements, the major technological progress to happen in academia and maybe in some of the monumental labs such as the AT&T Bell Laboratories or the TJ Watson uh, labs of IBM, the Exxon Labs in Ronsleydale, things have been changing incredibly much. Now we see big uh, technology, big science being produced in startups, in corporations. We see uh, lots of funding being directed exactly in this direction. International VCs invest very heavily exactly in research. And we are also witnessing uh, some major uh, departures from the past, like uh, the co-development, big co-development projects that take place between uh, corporations and, and research institutions worldwide uh, for development of IP. And, uh, of course, we, we see even technology transfer offices of powerful universities actually becoming companies themselves and entering the, the stock market. So these are big, big departures from what we were used to. Uh, can, can, can Greece benefit from this uh, cosmogony uh, uh, that is happening in, in research these days? Uh, I hope we will, uh, we will get answers to that and, and what will be the directions. I will start with Yanis Gikopoulos. Uh, and, uh, and Yanni, you are uh, now the Chief Innovation Officer of Qualco. This is uh, an international company of 35 uh, countries, the international footprint. It's an it's innovative fintech, data insight, data insight for decisions. Uh, You've left actually uh, Amsterdam to take over this uh, this job, so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to call it brain gain, but still, uh, tell us about about uh, Qualcomm's next, uh, uh, I mean, uh, next plans. Perfect. So first of all, thank you very much. It's um, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here, and and um, you know be able to speak about the future from a place with with such deep roots in in the past. Um, within Qualcomm, but also within the, within the technology world, there, there's, there's a few things that have been happening, there's a few things that are happening. First and foremost, any and every type of what we call next generation technology, call it AI, call it machine learning, everything you know, that, that is driven by, by data to a very large extent has been you know, part of, of our daily lives now for a considerable amount of time. Um, it, it, it would even be, um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be amiss to, to, to say that, you know, next generation technologies at this point in time are old news, right? We've been around. Now, the, 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 during, during the last, you know, especially few months, the, the last couple of years, and to, to, to paraphrase the SAS um, acronym, uh, we had the DAAC. So, disease as a catalyst. So suddenly, um, 
unfortunately. Um, we had COVID act as a catalyst of the way that we're working, the way that we're communicating, the way that we are leveraging all these technologies. So we have we have seen how these technologies have, have come down from the, from the sphere of innovation down to you know, day to day life. Now the question still remains, and, and, and this, is the, this is the biggest point. How do you go from theory to practice? How can you make sure that all these fantastic new, new ways of working, all these fantastic ways of harnessing data, all these fantastic ways of creating insights um, are actually becoming part of corporate life. And, and this is what we aim to do within, within Coco. So we, we aim to bridge the chasm between theory, between academia, and real life use cases, creating value for our clients and their customers um, in, in a tangible, pragmatic, sustainable, long-term way. I would say that this would be the primary objective. Now, how do you achieve this? Three plus one different ways. One, definitely using technology as an enabler of top-line growth. Making sure that a company, a function, a unit can actually grow beyond its, its predictable growth curve by looking into data, identifying data, cleansing data, structuring data, governing data, getting insights, and with the help of those insights, going back to the company's customers and thus enhancing their journey. B, acting as a multiplier for human capital. There's, there's, been, there's, there's always been this fear of man versus machine, of, of the, 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 the Terminator coming in and um, you know, destroying and, and uh, clearing out humanity for, 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 for machines. That, that hasn't happened and that, that's not gonna happen. What, what is happening is that gradually we're seeing more and more subject matter experts, because I think, I think this is the basis of all, of all great new target operating models, becoming business analysts and identifying how and where technology can actually help them in creating competitive advantage. Thirdly, making sure that return on investment is maximized. Technology is the best way of creating that advantage. Technology is the best way of making sure that a dollar in actually creates most dollars out versus any other type of investment. And I'm gonna finish by saying that all of that is, is fantastic, but the plus one is that unless there is upfront investment in terms of where the talent is coming from, how the education is actually working, how are people being trained? How collaboration is being made? None of the above is gonna be feasible, right? Just, a, just a, two small numbers and I'm gonna conclude. Right now, even in the most advanced AI-enabled um, countries or societies, and then this country is Japan, unsurprisingly, um, only 24, 25% of the companies are what we call AI leaders, right? And if you look at the difference in terms of AI leaders and AI laggards, the amount of money that goes into investment into these next generation technologies, on the one hand is 3X, which sounds big. On the other hand, the delta is somewhere between one and 3% of top line. So still a very, very long way to go in terms of enabling investment and growth through these areas. Having said that, that one to three percentage points can actually provide additional returns anywhere between three and six percentage points in terms of gross operating margin. Right, just imagine that, three to six percentage points.
right. Let, let, me, let me pass to, to Michalis, Michalis Vahopoulos. Uh, Michalis, you want to speak in English or Greek? Uh, what I, 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 I will address the, the question in English. Right. Uh, it's, it's up to you for the, for the answer. So uh, it's, a, it's a new company, it's a young company, uh, uh, Link Business, and uh, you heard about uh, leadership in AI. You are a, a data scientist yourself uh, and a company that is award-winning. Uh, I recall the NBG Award uh, for the NBG Seeds Award in 2019. Uh, and you are a company that you have your roots into research laboratories, actually into public research laboratories. So uh, you stand to benefit a lot from this kind of, of investments right now. Uh, what are your plans and, and how do you proceed? First of all, it's a big time for us, a small company to be in this big forum. Νομίζω ότι ο καταλυτικός παράγων είναι να συμμετέχεις σε ένα οικοσύστημα καινοτομία. Και λέγοντας να συμμετέχεις, να είσαι ενεργό μέλος που πρώτα σκέφτεσαι πώς θα συνεισφέρεις και δευτερευόντως με ποιο τρόπο θα αποφεληθείς. Και αυτή την κουλτούρα, ψάχνοντας γύρω, όταν στην αρχή ήταν πολύ νέο το οικοσύστημα καινοτομίας στην χώρα, αυτή την κουλτούρα τη βρήκαμε στο Δημόκριτο. Και όντας ερευνητές εκεί και έχοντας κάνει επιτυχημένα έργα, δεν σας κρύβω ότι η πρώτη ερώτηση, ο πρώτος άνθρωπος που ρώτησα αν αυτή η ιδέα έχει μέλλον και νιώθει ωραία η ομάδα μου να την υλοποιήσουμε, ήταν μέσα στο Δημόκριτο. Και αν δεν είχα πάρει από εκεί ενθάρρυνση, όσο έμπειρος ή γερός στο μάχη να είχα, θα έπαιρνα πολύ μεγαλύτερο ρίσκο για να το κάνω. Επομένως, το νούμερο ένα είναι να μπορείς να έχεις ένα περιβάλλον όπου να υπάρχει διάλογος μεταξύ των επιχειρηματικών αναγκών και των αποτελεσμάτων της έρευνας. Και αυτός ο διάλογος γίνεται πολύ πιο γρήγορα όταν μεσολαβούν ερευνητές ή επιχειρηματίες που έχουν όρεξη να κάνουν crossover χωρίς ταμπού. Αυτό λοιπόν είναι το πιο σημαντικό κομμάτι. Τώρα, εμείς πήγαμε επίσης ενάντια στο ρεύμα, αρχίσαμε να ασχολούμαστε και να κάνουμε υπηρεσίες από open data για επιχειρήσεις που στην ουσία δεν είναι πραγματικά open data ούτε το γεμί, μόνο η διάβγεια και το ΕΣΠΑ, πολύ λίγες πηγές είναι σε καλή μορφή όπως το εξωτερικό για να κάνεις υπηρεσίες. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν λειτουργήσαμε και εκεί στην κοινότητα των Open Data, φέρνοντας ένα πολύ μεγάλο οργανισμό, το Open Data Institute στη χώρα, για να βοηθήσει και την κοινότητα των Open Data να λειτουργήσει. Άρα λοιπόν, εν ολίγης, για να καταφέρουμε να έχουμε πια υπηρεσίες που βοηθούν τις εταιρείες σήμερα να κάνουν με έναν καινούριο τρόπο B2B Sales Generation, KYC, η εθνική, το Digital Business Onboarding που βλέπετε, το έχουμε φτιάξει όλο από πίσω εμείς, βασιστήκαμε στο να αξιοποιήσουμε και να διαλεχθούμε με την ερευνητική κοινότητα και την επιχειρηματική κοινότητα ως ενεργά μέλη. Thank you. So now I will address the question to the major investor here. And uh, Yanni Calza, you, you're representing, I, I think, the, the wealthiest bank in the world. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you uh, have undertaken uh, these, these efforts, these investment efforts in Greece. And I know I'm, I'm myself grateful for, for uh, picking up research also as one of the, of the targets of EIB the last few years. Uh, what, what are the plans now? I mean, the, with all these, uh, with these radical changes is, uh, in Europe and, and the world, uh, is EIB uh, targeting specific uh, areas for, for research? And, and what about Greece? Thank you very much, Jorgo, and thank you for the kind uh, kind words. Um, of course, the, the EIB is a public bank, so uh, 
we, it's, very, it's very funny because normally when I present in Northern European countries, the first question is, this is our money, this is the taxpayers' money, it's not, uh, it's not your money. Just to clarify that uh, uh, in this case, the EIB does not use taxpayers' money, use the guarantee of the member states and this be able to, to, to borrow money very cheaply in the markets, negative interest rates currently, and then to pass this advantage without trying to make profit, but to, to push certain areas. And one of these areas, indeed, uh, is uh, research and development. And you're absolutely right that uh, uh, we have seen a revolution in the way that uh, R&D is perceived. I was comparing what we were doing um, in um, between 2000 and 2010 uh, in Europe in terms of R&D. And although even then we had <coughs> innovative, pioneering R&D projects. I remember back in 2001, for example, I was looking, the reports were financing the hydrogen uh, technology of a major um, European automotive company, their R&D program. And uh, I was looking at the report, their concerns that uh, will we have enough uh, energy in the future? Uh, uh, they were worried that gas is not sustainable, but maybe we have to move to nuclear that uh, hydrogen is a vector of energy, it's not energy source by, by itself. So, you know, we have to, to address this uh, security question. But while, while they were pioneering research uh, projects at the time, most of this, the research during that era was what we call evolutionary research, which was the most commercially successful. What kind of research used to be the most commercially successful? It is the zillette from one blade to two blade. There was the most money uh, were made. We have a complete change now. We have uh, all the major European companies that is our, most of our clients to really take risks and invest in uh, disruptive technologies or expecting to produce disruptive uh, technologies. You see some technical descriptions of their projects and you feel this is science fiction. This will never uh, take place. But also there is a change in mentality. One of the radical changes that we have in the EIB, for example, the last three years is it was unthinkable three years ago that the EIB to finance defensive research, defense. It was a European institution, an international organization with a mission of development would never touch defense, whatever it has to do, could be used for war or or um, this kind of uh, technology. There's a change of thinking and we feel that um, uh, defense and uh, research, dual research that also can touch um, the defense uh, sector is not only vital for the security of Europe, but it is also a, a source of huge innovation for, uh, uh, for the future. So a lot of uh, investment currently in really disruptive uh, technologies. I would like to highlight, for example, the area of climate change. We have major companies s investing crazy amounts of money to things that most likely will not happen, but they're willing to take uh, bets because they feel that climate change probably will not be able to, unfortunately, to lower the emissions. So what we we'll need will be some disruptive technology to bring radical change in the way that we, uh, our economies uh, are operating. So, and this is where more of our research is channeled. When it comes to Greece, um, we do feel that Greece has, a, has an opportunity and uh, uh, what we have done was to select uh, the best of the research centers in Greece the last few years, Democritus, was one of uh, them. And actually, the reason that Democritus Yorgo was one of them it was because I think partly you had the vision and you took a Democritus that had the image of this nuclear uh, uh, pilot nuclear uh, facility in the middle of the campus. You put it aside and you really adjusted your thinking at the time and you brought um, uh, some of the best companies in the world that. They are, uh, they are sitting today, today with us to come to Greece and to partner to, to do the production. Our next, uh, what we want to do, the re part of our mission is to, to channel also in Greece important amounts of 
EU grants that are currently um, available for, uh, for research. So we're a bank, we're giving loans, we provide venture capital, but we feel also Greece should not uh, stay outside of uh, this opportunity uh, of um, uh, structural funds or other resources that could benefit these uh, companies. And I'm glad, and I have, we have talked many times, that uh, our partnership for Democritus or the other research centers should be just the beginning. Now is the time ahead. Okay, this is, this is very exciting to hear. And, and now, uh, for, for all these years, we've been talking about the fourth uh, industrial revolution, and it's time that we start speaking about the second quantum revolution. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, to, to speak about that, uh, Professor Angelakis is, is here with us. Uh, it's expected, and I'm not going to produce a hype here, uh, it's expected that quantum computers will disrupt everything, will disrupt our everyday lives, will disrupt companies, entire industries, the world. Uh, and, uh, and we are just uh, seeing the beginning, but already we see a lot of research taking place in the academia, in big corporations, and startups as well around the world. So you have a, a, a very a, a, a good experience uh, as a PI in Singapore, in one of the most uh, dynamic quantum centers right now in the world. So it, it, we, are, we are all waiting to hear how, how things are going to change and, and what are going to be the benefits for that. Thank you, George. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, Really glad to be here, back home, uh, in the center of the world, in the navel of the world, on Falosis Gis. Um, first time in Delphi. Um, I quite enjoyed the, the week. Um, lots of uh, interesting talks uh, on science and, and defense and security and everything. So I'll speak with my um, startup hat mainly, but I do have two more hats. I'm a professor in Singapore in the first center for quantum technologies we founded 15 years ago. Um, we were in Cambridge at the time, and Singaporeans decided to uh, start something in quantum. They didn't have much in quantum at that time. Um, I think Greece now has more than Singapore had 10 years ago. And, but they went very dynamically, and they managed to make a, a top 10 um, R&D centers in the world. So what is quantum computing? Let me start with the quantum revolution first. Um, you already lived the first quantum revolution. You have it in your pockets. This is, this is semiconductor technology that's based on quantum revolution 1.0. We ma managed to make semiconductors work because of wave mechanics and quantum mechanics of the early 20th century. Now we're going through the second quantum revolution. This is where information itself is quantized. The bit itself becomes a quantum object, and it sounds very exotic and almost um, uh, start tech technology, but it's true and it's a necessity. Why it's a necessity? Because we're already reaching the limit of classical computers in terms of power and processing and size. As we heard earlier, data is exploding. We double in size every, almost every year. It's impossible to keep track and, and produce faster and faster classical computers based on the way we build classical machines at the moment. The smallest connection in a transistor, even in this kind of phones, already hitting the atomic limit. At the atomic limit, nature is very different. Something uh, can be on and off at the same time. Current can go through or not. A switch can be on and off at the same time. It's extremely uh, exotic and maybe even crazy, but that's how it operates. The idea is to turn that to our use and design new machines. That's why it's a disruptive technology that exploit that that quantum superposition to do massive parallel computation. So when we say parallel, we mean about things that take six months or a year done in a few hours. Of course, this is the algorithmic part, this is the software part, this is where we are in terms of mathematics. The devices are being built at the moment, they are not full scale yet. We are reaching that limit at the, quite, quite soon, I think, because that's why industry is important to come in. This, this work is coming out of universities. There are massive um, investments in, in private uh, sectors. Uh, lots of my colleagues left their universities and worked for Google or IBM recently, the last five years, or started their own companies. Um, I mentioned one or two, for example, from University of Maryland. You might have heard IONQ 
was valued for $2 billion as a startup in, in ion traps, which is a very atomic physics exotic technology. And so, so the question is, uh, what's next? How, how we can, especially in terms of, of the Greek ecosystem, what can be done and how small Greece but could, could also play a, a role in this, in this uh, evolution. Europe, I, I would like to say that Europe is already investing heavily. There is the quantum flagship for the 10 years, the next 10 years. We had big data, graphene, and now the quantum technologies flagship is a, you know, it's a big push. Uh, we, di we do need a, a local national initiative, national quantum initiative. I think we will need um, a quantum institute in Greece. And, and my personal opinion is that Greece can really compete on the software and algorithm side. We have very talented people coming out from the universities. I, I, I teach at the Technical University of Crete. Um, 50% of our startup in Singapore are actually students that uh, have finished in Crete and they work remotely writing algorithms, writing quantum enhanced AI, quantum data analytics type of approaches, uh, looking at real, real use cases. So I think it's an exciting time and uh, looking forward to interact with you. Afterwards. Great. Me too. I, I hope Greece this time will be one of the revolutionaries <laughs> and not just, um, not just following the the, the outcomes. Yanni, uh, Yanni Kalza, uh, I'm going back to defense uh, because you mentioned it and I think we will be talking a lot about defense the next few years. Uh, yesterday in Brussels it was announced that NATO is creating a, an innova innovation fund ready to, to invest in startups uh, and, um, and uh, quantum computing is one of the, of the fields that, that NATO is uh, choosing for that, along with, of course, AI and, and big data and space uh, and biotechnology. Uh, EIB uh, y yourselves, how, how open you will be uh, in, in directly li linking your, your projects with defense? First of all, congratulations, Jorgo. This is, uh, this is a great achievement. It has to be mentioned that among eight countries that they were competing to get the NATO center uh, for uh, defense, no? Uh, the accelerator for The accelerator? Yes. Among eight countries? Yeah, no. it, there were more, there were like 22. Okay. And now we are on one of the eight accelerators. So Greece, yeah. Democritus, got it. So, I mean, this is a, a big success. Eh? It's worth being highlighted. It's not very talked. I mean, it's... The news these days are more about uh, negative news and family dramas, but this is something that I think really is worth to be, to be highlighted. So congratulations, first of all. And then the second, as I mentioned, uh, for us this is something new, but what is clear is that uh, what Europe realized is that there are other superpowers like the United States that they invested heavily in defense and this has benefited tremendously their uh, industries and uh, as well as, of course, their capacity to protect themselves. So we will not finance weapons directly. We will not finance uh, bombs and missiles. What we will finance, however, is this kind of research which has a dual use that can be applied for defense industry but also can have commercial, business applications that can help uh, the people in uh, their everyday life. And there, there are three dimensions. There's the first, the startups, where we have established together with the EIF uh, uh, funds where we would be able to take this kind of investments. Then, together with the European Commission, we will be managing the European, um, the, the EIC, the European Innovation uh, 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 Committee, where we will be able to go for the next step. Because the crucial is from the startup to move afterwards to commercial production. And there they will be available for uh, from 500,000 uh, euros up to 50 million euros, either equity or grants, to be able to push uh, this kind of uh, evolution. And of course, third, afterwards, we'll be very happy to finance cooperation with corporates, because if you want these um, you know, startups, of course, they have a very important role Taking the startup has also a very crucial role, but very often 
uh, a partnership with a big corporate, a big company to take this project and bring it in, uh, in a much higher speed in all corners of the world is quite, uh, quite important. We'll be very happy there to, to do the finance. Great. Okay, Mihaly. Uh, now, um, with uh, the establishment of, uh, of the NATO accelerator, startup accelerator at Democritus, for instance, you will be surrounded now by, by startups coming from all over uh, the, the member countries of, of NATO uh, doing also def defense projects. How comfortable you feel with that, and, and uh, are you planning to take advantage uh, in this ecosystem that will, will take this coloring now? I think it's an exciting και συνεχίζοντας από αυτό που έλεγα πριν, στο οικοσύστημα λοιπόν έχουμε ένα πολύ σκυρό ερευνητικό ίδρυμα που κάνει εκπαίδευση και έρευνα. Έχουμε μικρές εταιρείε. Τι μας λείπει ακόμα. Μας λείπουν μεγάλες εταιρείε, όπως η Qualco, ελληνικές. Γιατί οι ξένες το έχουν στο DNA τους. Και funds, τα οποία θα έρθουν να συμπληρώσουν αυτό το τετράπτυχο. Με κοινή συνισταμένη αυτό που έλεγα πριν, πραγματικά διάθεση ενεργητική για συνεργασία. Όχι με τον παραδοσιακό ελληνικό τρόπο που πολλές φορές γίνεται σε άλλα μικρότερα εγχειρήματα. Επομένως, έχοντας πρώτα απ' όλα είμαστε τώρα πλέον ως μέλη της, του ομίλου Κουάλκο, όπου τους έχουμε καταφέρει να εισαγάγουμε και τη λογική ε, της μικρής εταιρεία, Ήταν ήδη έτοιμοι να τα ακούσουν αυτό στο Κουάλκο και νομίζω ήρθε και ως καταλυτικός παράγον η συνεργασία με τον Δημόκριτο. Νομίζω ότι έχοντας και το πέμπτο κομμάτι που είναι η διεθνή σκηνή, startup, funds στη συνέχεια, αρχίζει να συμπληρώνεται ένα παζλ επιτυχίας, να μην ξεχάσω βέβαια και όλη την κτηριακή ανασυγκρότηση που οργανώνεται, διότι καταλαβαίνω ότι η ζήτηση για χώρους θα είναι πολύ μεγαλύτερη, διότι και άλλες ελληνικές εταιρείε θα θέλουν να ακολουθήσουν το καλό παράδειγμα της Κουάλκο, όπου πίστεψε σε ερευνητέ και σε μικρές εταιρείε και θα θέλουν να μπουν σε αυτό το οικοσύστημα. Νομίζω ότι μόνο να κερδίσουμε έχουμε από τις συνέργειες που χτίζουμε σε διαφορετικά μεγέθη, διαφορετικά αντικείμενα, καθότι για μας η τεχνολογία των δεδομένων είναι η οριζόντια γραμμή που ενώνει όλα αυτά που κάνουμε και ζούμε στην εποχή όπου η δύναμη των δεδομένων λειτουργεί ως υποδομή για να κάνεις πράγματα. Δεν μπορείς να ζήσεις χωρίς αυτή την οποδομή. Είτε κάνεις defense, είτε κάνεις business services, είτε κάνεις market intelligence, είτε κάνεις quantum computing and engineering. Okay. All right. In the last two minutes, Yanis Kikopoulos, how ready, how, how thoughtful you are about embracing technologies such as quantum in a corporate world? How about making the steps towards Quantum AI in a, in a large yes, one, one, international one, one, one small step for, for research, one, one giant step for corporate entities. So I think, you know, the, the world is as ready as the world is, but at the same time, research is going to make sure that quantum, quantum computing, quantum technology, in exactly the same way that edge computing before that, the cloud, even data centers, actually enable the corporate world. Now, is that something that we can harness today and tomorrow and in six months? Probably not. Having said that, the, the, the advances of technology, and I'm sure it's gonna be exactly the same within, within quantum computing, are almost a part of day-to-day of, of -day life. So again, I cannot give you a timeline. I'm sure it's gonna happen, right? At, at the end of the day, you know, Within, within the corporate world and within anything that the corporate world serves, it is all about reducing latency in, in all its forms. So quantum computing is, is a critical part of that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see the effect. Great. And Dimitri, what will it take for you to start venturing in, in quantum in Greece, for, for Angel Q quantum computing to start 
ventures in Greece? What will it take? Well, uh, Angel QCoin community is already active in Greece. As I said, half of our staff are uh, graduate students or students that come out of local universities, and I plan to enhance that. And then, then venturing, I'm happy to talk to see how we can get local Greek businesses quantum ready for the disruptive revolution, because it's going to happen. And, and it's going to happen like the internet. It will happen and it will be disruptive and you won't want to be out, left out. So that's the... All right. Well, thank you very much. I never introduced myself. I'm George Runesis. I'm the director of the National Center for Scientific <laughs> Research. Democritos, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.